Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Sojourning Writer. Today we're going to be discussing setting and atmosphere. Both are critical elements in our story as they allow us to show our world without telling the reader. But first, before we get into the topic, I want to discuss a couple things. First, I want to encourage you to think about how you spend your time reading, whether it's purposeful or leisurely. The goal of the writer, while reading, is to enhance their ability to write. This can only truly happen when the writer makes the comprehension of the text that they are reading the primary purpose. While reading for pleasure has some value, the writer must make their growth primary if they are able to write their own stories effectively. This means how we read can more positively impact how we write. So I just want to encourage you to make it a point to learn as much as possible from what you're reading. The second idea is collective consciousness. The shared set of beliefs, ideas, and moral attitudes which operate as a unifying force within society. What this means for writing is we use those shared ideas of the world to help create a connection for the reader. This is done by using the same elements we see in other pieces of storytelling, shortcutting wordy explanations to get the reader to feel the way we need for the sake of the story. There are two elements that are important to achieve this. The first is setting. The setting of the story refers to the time, place, and environment in which narrative events unfold. Authors use setting to immerse readers in specific time period, geographical location, and even a vividly imagined world. By choosing the setting, we've already begun the process of creating the second point, the atmosphere. The feeling or sense evoked by an environment or setting. Writers develop a story's atmosphere with description and narration using literary devices and techniques like setting, imagery, dictation, and figurative language. With these terms in place, let's get started on the topic. A little about the author. John Ronald Raoul Tolkien, or more commonly known as J.R.R. Tolkien, the father of the modern fantasy story. If you pick up just about any fantasy story off the shelf, you will find similar elements to what he had written. He was also a professor at Oxford University. He was a veteran of World War I and survived the Battle of the Somme. The Somme was one of the deadliest battles in World War I, lasting 140 days, with over 1 million casualties on both sides. On the first day alone, almost 20,000 English troops died. He was close friends with C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, as well as countless papers, articles, and books on everything from theology to education to politics. Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, as well as an expanded Lord of the Rings world. If you haven't seen the greatest movie trilogy ever, not you, then you must go and watch the extended version right away. The theatrical version does not count. A history of the poem of Beowulf. Considered an epic poem similar to Paradise Lost, Dante's Inferno, the Iliad, and the Epic of Gilgamesh. It was produced sometime between 975 and 1025 AD. It's almost 1,000 years old. It was passed on orally. Like most epic poems, it was passed down from one generation to another verbally. It comprises 3,182 lines. And spoiler alert for this thousand-year-old story. It starts off with a prelude of Hrothgar and Grandel. Then, a man by the name of Beowulf heard of the hall and the monster that was killing the king's men. Beowulf arrives and says that he will kill Grandel. Anferth questions Beowulf's abilities. Grandel arrives and has his arm torn off by Beowulf. Grandel runs back home and ends up dying. Grendel's mother, very upset, attacks the hall and kills the king's best fighter. Beowulf is somewhere else during the escape, so he doesn't die. But Beowulf leads a number of king's men to go kill Grendel's mother. After a close fight, where only his armor saves him, Beowulf kills her with a sword made for giants. Beowulf returns home from his victory and becomes king of his tribe. About 50 years later, a slave steals a golden cup from a dragon's lair. Beowulf goes and tries to fight the dragon himself but is outmatched. All but one of his men, Higloff, runs in fear. Higloff helps him, but Beowulf is mortally wounded during the fight. Higloff admonishes the cowardice of the other men, as Beowulf would have been alive if they had helped. Beowulf is burned on a great pyre. With Beowulf's death, his people worry that they will be open to attacks from other tribes. Now let's get into the text. The hall towered high, with horned gables wide awaiting the warring bellows of destroying fire. The time was not far off that between father and daughter's spouse, murderous hate in memory of a deadly feud should awake again. From Tolkien, here 
we have a reference to the doom in store for Herat, the glorious hall. Its characteristics of our poet and most of the Anglo-Saxon poets who have left any traces to put its dark note of doom immediately after telling of the hall's new-built splendor. The doom, of course, derived from lays or tales in which the destruction of Herat by fire was an event in the past, the hall. First, it's described as a glorious hall, and in some places, it's called a golden hall. But while it's glorious, there's a threat of doom or destruction by fire that sits on the mind. This creates a mental image of the scene, but also weighs on the soul. Here we see the juxtaposition with regards to the hall. First, it's described as a glorious hall, and in some places, a golden hall. But while it's glorious, there's a threat of doom or destruction by fire that sits on the mind. This creates a mental image of the scene, but also weighs on the soul. One of the ways we can do this in our writing is with setting. For instance, if we are creating a cyberpunk scene, we need to be able to visualize what the reader will be reading before we put it on the paper. To help do this, we can pull out Google and search the term cyberpunk. Here I've used a website called Pixel Bay and have searched for the term cyberpunk. We can also use terms linked with cyberpunk, such as body modification or body modding, cyberware, and AI, artificial intelligence. These are the things that our main character can experience before the inciting incident or the start of the story. Now, something we need to keep in mind is to avoid cliche terms like dark and stormy night. It is always best policy to find new ways of saying the same thing that others have. A cliche is a tired, stale phrase or idiom that, because of overuse, has lost its impact. What once feels like a fresh way of looking at something has become a weak prop for writing that feels unimaginative and dull. Clichés are what you write when you don't have the energy or inspiration to think of a new way of expressing the idea. Now let's move into atmosphere when it comes to character design. Then, at his allotted hour, sky the valley and passed into the keeping of the Lord, and to the flowing of the sea his dear comrades bore him, even as himself had bidden them while yet their prince. He ruled the skylings. With his words, beloved lord of the land, long he was master. There at the haven stood with ringed prow, ice hung, eager to be gone, the prince's bark. They laid then their beloved king, giver of rings, in the bosom of the ship, and glory by the mast. Here we have a description of Skip, and there's one thing that I really wanted to focus on, the title giver of rings. The word ring giver really means king or overlord. However, there's more to the definition. The soldiers or men who return from home fighting for their king or land would receive valuable charms from the king or overlord, such as arms rings or neck rings. In this case, the king is known as the ring giver because he distributes priceless gold only to those bold men. In other words, ring givers distribute wealth for special purposes. Arm rings and neck rings distributed by the ring giver are a reward for a warrior's enormous courage and strength. Brave heroes who show off their arm rings and neck rings in public eventually make others jealous of their courage and values. Therefore, the heroes guard these precious jewels with their life. All of this to say that he was just not someone who gave gifts, but rather someone who appreciated those who did a good service for him. It's a basic element of human behavior that actions that are rewarded are ones that are continued. This is the same when it comes to training pets. If you reward the actions you want, you get more of those actions. This is not the only result. Rewarding the action also builds a bond between the rewarder and the one being rewarded. Punishment not only just discourages the action, but also creates a disconnection between the receiver and the giver. The next aspect we can use to add atmosphere in our descriptions is when it comes to location. From the text, in a hidden land they dwell upon the highlands, wolf hunted, and, and windy cliffs, and the perilous passes of the fens, where the mountain stream goes down beneath the shadows of the cliffs, a river beneath the earth. It is not far hence in measurement of miles that the mare lies over which there hangs remy thickets, and a wood clinging by its roots overshadows the water. There may each night be seen a wonder grim, fire upon the flood. There lives not the children of men, one so wise that he should know the depth of it. 
even though harried by the hounds of the ranger of the heath a heart strong in his horns may seek that wood being hunted from afar sooner will he yield his life and breath upon the shore than he will enter to hide his head therein no pleasant place is that hence doth the tumult of the ways rise darkly to the clouds when the wind arouses tempests foul until the airs are murky and the heavens weep here the king is giving beowulf a description of the land that grendel our monster lives it is essentially a bog a bog or a bog land is a wetland that accumulates peat as a deposit of dead plant materials often mosses Typically of the Spurgrinian moss, it is one of four main types of wetlands. The other names for bogs include mire, mosses, quagmire, and muskig. Alkaline mires are called fence. A bog head is another type of bog found in the forests of the Gulf Coast states in the United States. They are often covered in heath or heather shrubs, rooted in sphagrium, moss, and peat. The gradual accumulation of decayed plant material in a bog functions as a carbon sink. There are a number of things that create fear in the minds of readers, two of which are the unknown and death. A bog is full of death, not just of vegetation, but it's also not uncommon to see stories where murderers hide their victims in the marshlands. Another bog-like place is the bayou. This location, coupled with stories of the supernatural, has created a sense of unsettling in the minds of the reader. Bogs or swamps, coupled with fog, can add a sense of closeness as there could be some hidden threat that is unable to be seen, ready to strike at any moment. So here we have gone over three different ways we can use setting to help create atmosphere in a story. Next time, we will be creating a story from scratch so we can apply what we've learned here today. Please join us next time, and if you have any suggestions for a topic, or a book you would like to see used, please let me know in the comments below. As always, I add the resources I've used in the description below. Until next time. I am a poor wayfaring stranger I'm traveling through this world of woe Yet there's no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright land to which I go.